Hello everyone and welcome back. I have been continuing to collect a lot of antique shoes and I recently came across a set that is probably the most unusual thing that I have. And it's a set because it's not a pair. It's actually a trio of left shoes from around the late 1840s. And these have informed my view of how to date shoes so incredibly much in just a few days of looking at them. And I really want to get a chance to share them with you because not only are they great examples of the time period that they come from and of the construction techniques and all the little fashionable details, but there's an interesting story to pull out of them. And it is my hypothesis more than it is fact, but I think it tells us a lot about how shoes were made, purchased, and worn, and loved. So let's take a look at these three shoes. Now I specified that they are three left shoes. They don't have their pair. It's just these three shoes. And they are very, very similar at first glance, but they are all a little bit different. So first looking at what is the same about them. They are all flat shoes. They have no heels. They are straight last, meaning they are not right or left, which is pretty typical from the 18th century well through the 1850s and even into the 1860s. We start to see that transition occurring beginning around the 1840s, however. A great example is this 1847 book where they're talking about how right and left is not a new invention, but it is starting to come back again. It's something they're considering as potentially more healthy, but it really depends on the exact shape of the right and left. It shouldn't be too bent or too curved, whatever it might be. So these are pretty exemplary of before the major transition occurs. So they're at least earlier than 1860s. And also by the fact that they have no heel, puts them before the 1860s as well. Once we reach 1851, high heels come back in with a vengeance after the Great Exhibition shows a lot of different examples of them. And it takes a while for it to make its way into just about every pair of women's shoes. But by the time we reach the late 1850s, early 1860s, it's much more common to see them with heels than without. So these are more likely earlier than that for those reasons alone. I do know also that they are French. There are a few notable things with this. Not only do two of them have little labels in them that say gauche, meaning left versus droit, right? We also can look at the sizing system. They are sized in what is exactly the same as the European sizing system for shoes today. And they are based off of the metric system with centimeters and each size is two thirds of a centimeter or what they actually call a Paris point. So if a shoe is 24 centimeters long, it is a size 36. And that's about where these are. In fact, these are three different sizes. We first have one that is 35, then we have 35 and a half, and then a 37 and a half. These sizes are not only written on the interior, two of them have it written on the insole, one has it written on the lining, but they also have it stamped on the toes of the shoes as well. And I thought it was particularly interesting that the half was denotated by a sideways one because they don't have a one half stamp. Even the writing of the one half that's the clearest definitely looks more like a percentage than a half. So it's more the representation of one half than actually writing it out. So yes, that does mean, wow, these do look pretty outrageously small to our modern eyes. It's not that they are incredibly tiny sizes. They are comparable in length to the modern EU sizes. In fact, the largest is my size. <laughs> I'm usually around a seven, seven and a half in American and around a 37 to 38 in EU, but they are very narrow compared to what we are used to seeing. The heel width on these is about the same width as across the ball of the foot. And so they're just much narrower and daintier in that sense than we're accustomed to. So they look a lot smaller, but the thing is they're very flexible. So this is more like a pair of socks with a very light sole than it is a sturdy shoe that we're used to today that needs a lot more space for our foot to move around in. There's a second number on all of them that I haven't quite figured it out yet. We have 26, three and 25 and a half. And I don't know what those necessarily denote because it isn't corresponding to the width of the shoes. They're all actually really similar in width. And there are a few other things that it might be talking about, but I haven't figured that out yet. And it could also just be a note to do with the style or the last or something in the manufacturing process. So it might not be something that I can actually measure, but it might be an in-house sort of concept. The symbols and the use of the gauche 
tells us that they are from France and dates us to probably after 1840, because that's the point that France started picking up the metric system. Again, it was sort of a return to a late 1790s version of measurement systems. And it took a little bit of time for other European countries to pick up on doing the metric system, a whole big thing in the mid century. But 1837 to 1840 was a major transition in France. So likely these are going to date to post 1840. The major similarity between the three of them mostly comes down to what they are made out of. So the fabric in all three is exactly the same fabric. The ribbon that trims the edges is the same ribbon. It's dyed lavender on the exterior, but not on the part that folds over. So they sort of half dyed it. One of the shoes clearly saw more water damage than the others and it's bled a little bit. I know that that's the case because there's another cord inside of that grain ribbon that goes around, which is white. It's obviously white by the little ends that stick out. It's meant to sort of tighten down the shoe slightly around the opening if you need it to. It doesn't do a lot of difference, but it's also there to kind of help keep it from stretching out with time. And it is definitely white, but in the example that we can see where it's come out of the back, it's now purple. And that's the one that has the most purple ribbon on top. And I did consider the possibility that these were all dyed at a later point in time to be the exact same purple, that that's what really makes them look like they go together, but the dye would have seeped through into the white linen of the vamp. And while there is some bleeding, it looks much more like the shoes got slightly wet or damp from sweat. And the, you know, the color bled through in a few little places here or there. On top of that, all the stitching is done in that purple, whether it's on the exterior or the interior in areas that haven't bled through. So in the areas where some of the ribbon around the edge is still in an ivory color, these stitches are still the lavender tone. So I don't think that this was a matter of a dyed later shoe. It would be really difficult to do that without showing evidence of bleed through in a lot more places. So I think at some point there's a little bit of water damage that bled to this color. It was not a very uh, stable dye to say the least. And it's why they're a little bit mottled, a little bit discolored. They're also shattering, which is really common for silks in this time period throughout the 19th century. They were using weight of silk to price it. So the heavier it was, the more it was worth because theoretically that means it should have more silk packed into it, right? No, it actually meant that they were cheating the system by putting metal salts into their dyes, which if you think about it on a larger scale, little metal shards inside of your fine silk fabric, um, that will eventually cut away. <laughs> so that's just happening on a microscopic level. There's nothing that I can do about it. There's so many garments from the 19th century that have this issue. It's not a matter of the shoes were worn a bunch so much as the silk is just poorer quality and is disintegrating but they have the same exact silk, which signifies to me that they were made at the same time in the same place. They also have the same internal structures. They have white linen for the vamp and they have Wita, which is a tawed white leather rather than tanned with tannins and comes out darker leather for the back quarters or rather quarter. There is no back seam, which is pretty common for this era as well. There's also no other toe or heel extra layers to help reinforce that. And then the insole is also the same Wita and it's just pasted in there on top of the sole, which is incredible incredibly thin. These were not meant to be walking shoes. These were not meant to be long wear shoes. You might go for a pair of boots instead in this time period. That would have been a really popular option. These are pretty much dancing pumps or indoor shoes. They're meant for very light wear. They would be really great for dancing because of that lightness to them. They are constructed in a turn shoe style, which is really typical for this era and has been around for a while at this point where they're made over the wooden last inside out, stitched together, flipped, and then the insole put in. And in this case, they have incredibly tiny, tiny stitches. You can pull back the insole just enough to see them. They're very small. <laughs> And I almost kind of question if they weren't using an awl for this work, but just simply needles and really fine threads. So these are very daintily made and wouldn't actually have to be made by somebody who went through the entire shoemaking process. There definitely have to be shoemakers involved in the patterning, the cutting and uh, all of those things. But the fact that they are so finely daintily made means that they could be easily made by anyone without the hand strength that most shoemaking requires. <laughs> So I thought that was a notable, interesting feature of these. Yes, these are essentially meant to be worn and fall apart and be tossed out, which starts bringing us to the differences between these three shoes. 
First off, the most obvious thing is the wear and tear on the bottom. The smallest of them has almost no wear and tear. It looks pretty brand new. The middle size has a medium amount of wear and the largest has the most wear. You can actually not only see the footprint on this really distinctly, but in person, you can actually feel the ridges of where her toes would have been. So this shoe also is the one that likely had the water damage. And I think that's definitely the case. Once you add water to the element, it really shapes to your foot permanently at that point. So that one looks like it's seen the most wear. However, I did notice that the smallest shoe, the one with the least wear is by far the softest. It has been suede, meaning that's been roughed up again, sort of sanded down in order to get that suede finish to it. And looking at the middle shoe, there is a really dark line around the exterior of the shoe, which is something that they're starting to do a lot more late 1840s, early 1850s. They're starting to put that little trim around the edges and some other details like that. So that is more obvious in the middle shoe, but there's a very, very faint outline like that on the smallest, which makes me wonder if perhaps it too didn't see about the same amount of wear as the middle shoe and then was suede down, sort of like taking sandpaper to the leather in order to remove some of that wear and tear and make it look a little bit more fresh and new. This might have happened because it's easier to dance in the suede styles and move really easily on the wooden floors. So that might have been something to do for the care of it, but it wasn't worn a lot after that. The other major difference between the three is the fact that two of them have ties attached to them. The third one, the smallest one, has the remnants of ties. The middle one is a very fine thin silk ribbon, would have had one on each side of the shoe that would have wrapped around the foot and ankle and tied. However, the smallest and the largest used elastic and it is original to them. The larger one has the elastic still surviving. It is one long piece, so there's no tying. It's just going to wrap around as many times as it comfortably can to help hold the shoe in place, which is particularly popular when dancing and walking and moving and all that. The elastic in this gives us a more definitive date because 1844 roughly was when they figured out vulcanization of rubber and made it so essentially it didn't just deteriorate, fall apart pretty quickly. And it started very rapidly being used in things like elastic banding, elastic fabrics, all sorts of different things. By 1847, the Congress boot was all the rage with its big elastic panels on the side. So this could be anywhere from probably about 1845, 46 onwards. It can't be before that because it has elastic, but putting it in the late 1840s would make perfect sense because elastic was super trendy at that point in time for shoe options. So that supports that theory. The other difference between the three of them is actually a little bit more subtle. The toe shape, and the size and shape of the vamp is different for all three. The smallest has the roundest toe going up to the largest having the squarest toe. We also have the middle having the shortest vamp, meaning the longest opening, but it is the narrowest opening as well. So the smallest has the widest opening, the largest the middle opening width, and then the mid-sized is the smallest opening width. They're just kind of all over the place. It's not consistently larger to smaller in any of these cases. So they're all slightly different. The side seams are also in slightly different places. So this isn't a case of they simply used the same size of uppers on different shoes. So they're made a different toe length or something like that. No, they're all slightly different in, in all ways, but they are constructed in the same way. The uppers are all made by hand. So the hand stitching is still occurring here, which is another sign that it's not really going to be 1860s or later. They're also transitioning in the 1850s and 1860s towards more and more machine stitching to make this process much faster, but everything in here is hand stitched. So everything is the same in terms of basic construction and concept. They are stylistically just a little different, which is what makes them so absolutely fascinating because they are a great example of how shoes are made worn and worn out in this time period. Things are being mass manufactured. These are not custom made to the person because they wouldn't have put the sizes in them if they had. The sizes are very clearly marked on the toes and the interiors. And while some size notations, things like that might occur in custom work, so that way they know what last these things are supposed to go on to and what parts go together, the fact that these are noted on the toe with the stamp as well as on the interior and everything else going on, it says to me that these were mass manufactured. That's the more common option in the time period anyway. France is producing tons of shoes. UK, America, everybody is. So this is not a 
really weird thing. It also would explain why they're all exactly the same fabric. They're going to buy a huge quantity of relatively cheap fabric and cheap supplies and make up a lot of shoes in whatever this season's fashionable color is, because next season it will be a different color. And these were meant to be worn and worn out within a season or two. They're not going to last terribly long. But they have enough variation in terms of styles to make sure that everybody can find what they're looking for. They're likely pumping out tons of different sizes, different toe shapes, different proportions, covering whatever the fashionable range is at the time. Just like today, there's not one shoe that is the fashionable shoe. There are a few styles that are trending. And what likely happened, and this is where we move into my hypothesis, is that these three different shoes were purchased by a family. They have three daughters, this might also be a case of three friends purchasing shoes together, but I don't think that's as likely to be the case. I think it's much more likely that this is a family that went out, purchased these shoes together, and wore them at roughly the same time. Some might have been worn more than others, but that explains why there are different sizes, and it also kind of explains where there are three lefts and no rights. Somewhere in the world, theoretically, hopefully they survived, there are the three matching right shoes to this set. What I think happened is that shoes are incredibly personal and they are something that is very often surviving as a antique example. There are so many antique shoes out there, especially once we hit the late 19th, early 20th century. And that's because they're small, they're transportable. You can throw them up in a trunk in the attic and forget that they're there. They don't take up a bunch of space. They are not difficult to care for and they can't really be reused. Gowns can be taken apart and cut up and made into new things. They can be resized and reworked. Shoes can't really be altered. I've seen a few examples of shoes being altered for style or size. It is very rare and very unusual. And it's definitely more the exception than the rule. And with things like this, the style moves on and perhaps these were worn in the late 1840s and by the early 1850s, heels were coming in and they're like, yeah, just toss these shoes upstairs. I'm not gonna wear them. Heels are the new trend or maybe simply green is in this year. I, there's no way to know. So these were worn for a while and then put away. And the personal aspect comes into the fact that not only are they easy to keep, but they are really indicative of the people, especially if you have a memory like going and purchasing matching shoes with your sisters. <laughs> like that is a very distinct memory that you went to dances and balls and events together with the same shoes. That's something to cherish. You literally have someone's footprint embedded into one of these. And so they are intensely personal. And a lot of shoes are kept and cherished for that reason alone. So my hypothesis on this comes down to that's what happened. And these were split up between two different sisters, parts of the family and passed down that way. So that way, if they're split up with two different groups, perhaps one of the sisters is around, didn't want the shoes, whatever it may be. And two of them took three of each, so that way they'd have a shoe from each one of their sisters and keep them as a group that way, because that would be more meaningful than one person's pair or another person's pair. So that to me explains how we could have gotten to this point. I'm sure there are possibly other explanations and maybe it didn't happen like that at all, but that's the way that it makes the most sense to me. But it tells us a lot about the potential for how these shoes are made, sold, worn, worn out, and how they survive today. And it also tells us about why it's so difficult to date shoes because these are so similar, but so different. And honestly, as individuals, I probably would have put slightly different dates on them, especially if I didn't have that elastic to put a really specific date on some of these. The rounder toe shape and the longer vamps, things like that can put it looking more 1830s, more 1840s, more 1850s, even 1820s in some cases. So you have to take into account more than just the toe shape or one feature of these in order to put dates to them. I am hoping at some point that I will have enough examples that I can really lay out a very precise timeline of how to put dates on shoes. But that's gonna be a really big video and I need a few more examples before I get to that point. But I'm gonna continue sharing a lot of my antiques with you as long as you guys enjoyed this sort of thing. I have so many more shoes with so many more stories to tell.